Hello and welcome to another end of season edition of the Cardiff Central podcast. As ever, I'm Harley in the hot seat. I am joined by Dan. How are you doing, Dan? Oh, good. Cheers. Uh, an, un- an unfamiliar, familiar face. Carwin's back from his holidays. <laughs> hope, hope you had a good time, Bud. Yeah, great time, actually. Uh, so good that it was very difficult to come back, to be fair. Um, Harley's using Nice Airport being an absolute disaster, but that's another point entirely. <laughs> I... I blacked out the last time I used Nice Airport for my mind. It was that harrowing a tale. Um but also we do have a fourth chair we have a fourth chair occupied tonight. So we have the absolutely fantastic guru of all things Portuguese and European rugby, Francisco Isaac. How are you doing Francisco? Jesus, what a compliment to start. Harley, if you're trying to initiate me in some in some type of cult, I I might be interested because if you compliment me like that <laughs> every day, I I will gladly join your, your cult. Well, I joined the cult because called Cardiff and it doesn't bring good news most weeks. So thank you for that, Harley. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so part of the reason Francis goes on is at the start of the season, he was asking which Welsh side should I support in the URC and for some reason, he trusted me when I said, oh, you should support Cardiff. Because, <laughs> you know, it'll be great. Um, so, first of all, public apology uh, for for for, uh, for for putting you through all that heartache. I feel like you've got to be a seasoned Cardiff fan to to have put up with the season we had. But hopefully, you know, through, through a bit of th- group therapy now, hopefully we're going to talk about how the season probably wasn't all that bad despite the results. Uh, so no, no, no one's going to jump in and help me with that one, right? You, so you want me to jump in? You want me? To well, start, I was hoping but, someone would jump in. <laughs> you want me to start from the bottom or from the start? Uh, because if we start from the the start, why the Dragons and the other Welsh teams are hiring so mu- so many good players, and Cardiff is just like, okay, huh, we're happy with the, with the team. We have yeah, we lost Thomas Williams, Rhys Carey, Ellis Ellie Jake, and Owen Lane, uh Kieran Parker, Lopetti Tamani, we Willis Hollow Hall, we lost all of them, but it's gonna be fine. Gonna be fine. Why, Harley? Why? It's gonna be fine because we've re-signed Ben the, the Wonder Kid, Ben Thomas, Big Mac, you know, Domachowski Domachowski's still there, Azarati's still there, we've kept Rhys Litterick. Uh, you know, a, a new signing is being announced as we speak. Yeah, I, there's definitely plenty of positives to take on from the year, and also you've got to appreciate Cardiff are promoting from within. We're truly embracing our regional, you know, our our pathways. So you know, it's it's going to get better. Um, it's really hard to side. take you seriously with that t-shirt on. I've mean, just realised <laughs> you said all that this inspirational talk, and you've just got sarcasm across your chest. It's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So um, maybe maybe I have to put a photo out of this for the audio only <laughs> listeners because because uh, uh, yes, I did realise the irony of my wardrobe choice as I was trying to be the uh, the sensible, optimistic one, not sounding like the sarcastic git I usually am. Um, <laughs> Dan, maybe you should. Dan, you've you've been uh, one of the more positive uh, voices for the last few weeks. Do you want to, do you want to come and say, save my ass here? Well, I don't want. Are we just going into the season as a whole? Is that is that? Yeah, I think let's let's talk. I mean, do you want to? Go, should we just let me quickly write, rattle off the results? Well, I think set. I think the season starts with the context of last summer, and uh, it, it. I mean, if you take exact almost exactly twelve months ago, we are. No director of rugby, or he's suspended still at the, the time of chatting 12 months ago. It's eight players in pre-season training with just Jockey and Richie Reese, which is, I, I don't even know what drills you can do with eight players. Is four-a-side rugby a thing? I don't know. <laughs> but if, it, if it was, we were making it a thing. Um, and we had loads, of, we had a number of players who we wanted to recontract but couldn't. We had a number of players who... Uh, we were half in negotiations with for signing, but we didn't know if there was money there. So against that backdrop, to go from that in June to August, Dai Young leaves, Matt Sherrett comes in, we start announcing a few people. Gethin Jenkins comes in as a part-time defence coach. Scott Andrews is promoted from the academy to the first team as a, his first ever senior professional coaching job. Um having only retired from semi-pro rugby about two weeks before. Um, 
that that the that is the context against which everything is set when you discuss Cardiff season. I think so. You can mm. you can look in a a, a a very binary results way, and uh, on that level, you know, there's there's value in saying that it wasn't a good season, and we'll discuss mm. the results as as we go. But I think when when you're talking about 2023, 24 from a Cardiff perspective it starts from the lowest base imaginable. I mean, the only way you can start lower is basically if you just created a new club essentially last summer, because that, that's pretty much where we were come mid-August. So that I think from that point of view, it can o- you can only look up when, when you look at the season then and look at the results that, that came from October onwards. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's fair. Um, the the I, I remember go all the way back to when we started this pod, I think that, that we're looking at the first game of the season and I said what a huge game that was against Benetton. And I still think it was a huge game. I still think there's part of me that still thinks if that domino would have fallen the right way from a Cardiff perspective, a couple of more results go their way as well. I think not, you know, it's, it's, it's pro- 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 perhaps simplistic to say, but it was so indicative of what was to come for the rest of the season is that it was 30 minutes of brilliant rugby where Cardiff didn't take their opportunities, followed by probably a 10 minute spell in the second half where everyone lost their heads and then just getting pipped at the end through a mix of things. You know, that game, that game was obviously the red card that happened and things like that, but that wasn't where the game was lost. It was lost in the first half, as were many games in the season. I think. And I, I really do think it just maps out majority Boxing Day apart and a couple of others, but the majority of the season is that first game of what what happened, when it happened, how it happened, and maybe in some aspects, lessons weren't learned quick enough that perhaps needed to be throughout the season. Yeah, I think I think that's um, yeah fairly. Fair thing, as you said, you know, the, the Benison game did definitely set a tone for our season. You know, we both st- we started and ended the season with a bonus point, a, a losing bonus point loss with a red card at the end towards the latter stages. It's and actually, we ended up the worst team for red cards with five overall. Probably not, not our bright discipline, not being our brightest spot, but um, I am going to give Francisco a challenge. So, one of the listeners has said, uh, so friend of the pod, Andrew Ford, did ask. Are we likely to see you on the terraces uh, for next season? <laughs> and uh, also, if you could pick for one highlight, one good thing before before you tell me how what a terrible human I am of making you support Cardiff, what what would your highlight or what would be the best thing about the good points of a Cardiff be for you? The good points of being a Cardiff fan. Well, let's go to 29th of October. I have here in my notes. It was a game against the Dragons. And well, uh, at the time I thought well, that the Dragons weren't that bad. I think the next season they're going to do well. So, and it was great seeing. Car- I was very into that game. It was almost twenty something days after the war- last Portugal uh, game in the World Cup. So I was I went down, and that Cardiff game brought me up because it was good. It was intense. It was crappy. It was ugly. So it's it's a fairly good Six Nations Wales game of 2019 <laughs> Gatlin. It's the same. It was the same with the with with the Dragons. I think they had a penalty kick at the 70th minute. They scored. So everyone got really stressed when they lose this game. I was saying to Harley, "Is Cardiff going to lose? Is Cardiff going to lose again?" I'm. Am I supporting the Welsh Zebra or, <laughs> or something like that? Please tell me it isn't. And, well, it ended being a good game and, and a good win against one of the most heated rivals. But uh, I do think that Cardiff has potential and as everything in the Welsh Ravi, the problem is, well, and the investing and the structure and the project to the future – which is something that hinders most, and I'm not going to do a T2 talk, but it's what normally happens with nations that uh, are, try, are struggling. And I think there's good kids like Mason Grady, uh, which, well, 
it's normal that everyone ju jumped in because he's a really, really good player. But uh, listen, after that, it it was just it just was a fire, a massive dump dumpster fire. Like uh, I, 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 it's a, it's a, at some point I stopped watching and refocus everything I had in the party there. And every time I went to see Cardiff, I normally do the, this with the teams I like is I don't see the beginning of the game. I turn off Wi-Fi or block everything uh, that is linked to that match. And when it's second half, when I think it's second half, mid-second half, I turn in just to see if everything's going all right. And every time with Cardiff, it was like... <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, hey, sh shit, Harley, shit. Sorry for the cursing, but this was like... Because it, there's promise and it, it was intensity and at from some reason it all breaks for Cardiff. Even if in the end it seems they are fighting for a win, it's not fighting for a win. They're chasing to 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 flee from the from a certain defeat, and that's the thing that has to change for the future in Cardiff. They have to escape that mindset of we don't have we can't lose. Do we have to win? And even it, if it is a hard game, because, well, if they want to to spell a new era of, well, I'm not saying to go to win the Wii URC because that is hard. Oh, well, until Line City can go away or uh, go to another country like Greenland or Iceland or something, and we can block the Bulls from playing in the URC. Um, I think. Cardiff has to rebuild and to believe, but that's why I'm I'm worried with the signings because summer for me it's football signings and rugby signings, and I'm not seeing Cardiff moving. But sorry, I this is a monologue, and uh, and uh, to reply to Andrew, I hope I can go to Arms Park the next season. I have to go to the Prodigy for at least two games, get drunk in wine and and beer, and then <laughs> fly to Cardiff to not get drunk with beer because it's very expensive. Well, if Harley has beer at his home, I'll get drunk at Harley's home. If not, just a small beer and something to eat. But I definitely, I want to go to, to, to Cardiff to watch a game. Yep, excellent. I said, uh, depending, I said, depending on my uh, living situation, I, I'm sure I'll like, have a fridge full of beer in a bed for you if you need it. If not, you I'm are, sure there's plenty of people you are there already, You are already chasing excuses. You have to stop like you do with this. You have to stop. It's this and the dad jokes. You have already a dad joke shirt. Stop it, Harley. You have a disease. <laughs> I mean, it's not an excuse. I am currently living at my mom's. Well, that doesn't help you. That doesn't help you. No, it really doesn't. It's, no, uh, it doesn't. Yeah, choice of, choice of having to work out. 200 miles away from Europe, from your family. Uh, anyway, so, would you, Dan, Cohen, do you, you want to counter anything Francisco said or add to? Counter, simply, if, if he thinks Cardiff, <laughs> Dragons Cardiff is a good game, then I can be <laughs> like, <laughs> um, no, I can uh, imagine how Francisco was feeling during the World Cup watching Portugal, but like, you'd like, it's, it's, yeah, there's, um, it, I don't think I don't, there's been so much promise. That 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 word that Francisco said about promise. I think that's the big one. Is and there's been so much positivity and promise around the team, and it's just been moments of well, you know there were periods just before Christmas where Harley and I were getting frustrated and we're trying to hold it back. Um, I don't think we did successfully. <laughs> um, I remember certain comment criticizing us for being too negative, which was very apt. But there was. I think it was just a time where it was difficult to um, react to a result where you could see, right, I can see that combination Thomas or Bevan with De Beer working. I can see De Beer, Ben Thomas flourishing. And you look at the end of the season, how that's flourished, particularly the 10-12 combination. But then other areas of the game, seeing games out, perhaps discipline late on in games that know how to see out a game that was lacking and it was just the same repeated things. I, I, I never, never looked at it and thought, oh, this is a disaster. Um, that's probably the, but maybe I was looking over a little bit east and west and thinking that it was okay in comparison. But I think 
I think it was just one of those situations where it could have been so much greater the season, but it didn't quite live up to what it possibly could have been. I think, but, you know, I, I'm sure Dan will say, coming back to Dan's original point, say that from where they were, you know, <laughs> to, to get to where they ended up with four wins wasn't was was actually quite an achievement. Yeah, I think there, there's some stats which I was looking at this week which sort of frame what, we, what uh, Carolyn and, and Francesco just said about the promise element of it. We had eight players, 23 or under, play 12 or more times this season. Um, and if those there, so it's Evan Daniel, Evan Lloyd, Alex Mann, Mackenzie Martin, Cam Winnett, Jacob Beetham, Mason Grady, and Teddy Williams. And seven of those, so all but Evan Daniel, did it whilst being involved in either one or both of Wales's Six Nations and Summer International squads as well. So they've they've come in. I think of those, you'd say, I I probably say only Teddy Williams was a real established first twenty three player. Um, Mason Grady was there or thereabouts towards the back end of last season, but in terms of a season long of being in the first team, only Teddy had done that before. And they've immediately gone in and, and gone straight on to Wales International Honours. So you can see the the promise of those players and the potential of them. And then the other stat is 18 URC games and 10 losing bonus points, which is, I mean, uh, that shows then to Francisco's point about the mindset of the team. Uh, you'd, you, you, you can be positive, I think, about a lot of it, but if you get stuck in this rut of constantly being the nearly men and losing and, and you know, you don't develop that winning mentality, all this positivity and base building will have been for nothing eventually. So um, yeah, there was, there was a lot and a lot to like a lot of those nearly games were our own fault as well. Can we mentioned Kieran Parker's red card against Benetton Ellis Jenkins' red card against Scarlet. I'm confident that we beat them at home without that. I mean, we we nearly did, even with it, and that was a good 60 minutes. Um, Lilo some, and Connacht again. Yeah, Lilo and Connacht Same thing. as well. Yeah. A um, couple of occasions, Zebra away. It was, I know it was, the, it was a draw, so it didn't quite fit into the stats, but we failed to manage the last sort of 15 minutes of that game, ended up stuck on our own try line for a long, long period before they finally scored to draw it. So, yeah, there's... I think the season was was never going to be defined as a success or otherwise by the results. I think Jockey was really clear at the start of the season of, you know, we're not going to be in the playoffs. If anyone thought we were going to be in the playoffs at the start of the year, then, then I mean, they should commit themselves to some sort of institution or something because we weren't going to be there. But um, the success was, are we a better team at this point now talking than we were in October? And... I would argue in in probably the majority of aspects of our play, yes. Like we are, we're definitely a better defensive outfit now than we were at the start of the season. Our line out is a lot better than it was at the start of the season. The scrum has stayed at a relative level, but I don't think we're ever going to be a big scrummaging team. We're not, we're not massive as a, a pack or as a squad. So the scrum is a, is a means to an end in terms of just restarting play for our backs, really. And then attacking wise is is probably the the question mark you'd have overall, but I think a lot of that question mark comes down to pre Six Nations. Thomas Williams was our best player; he, he was the best player in the squad during the Six Nations. He was probably Wales's best player then as well in in a lot of times. Um, and then where he gets injured right to the end of that Italy game, we effectively have to learn how to attack again without him there and doing it with with Bevan at nine and not a slight on Bevan but he's not Thomas Williams and I mentioned it last week you know like he's got called up for the Wales squad which is great he's going to be a, a, a good player but Thomas is I would say he's, there's a generational talent there in what he offers uh, teams that he plays in um, and so the attack I think has probably it, it's gone up towards the Six Nations it's then dipped again post Six Nations but after that Judgment Day game is starting to come up again as we learn to attack without Thomas at nine again. So overall, yeah, I think you have to be pretty, pretty happy in a wider context. But this season will look much better if we get to the next Christmas with sort of four or five wins through October, November, December time. Um, whereas if we get to the next, yeah, yeah big time, fingers crossed. <laughs> 
but if we if we get there and we're still you know the losing bonus point blokes then then it's not looking as good overall yeah absolutely i think one of the things that um i said we sort of hinted on though i think for next season one thing that we'll need to improve is our dis is like the discipline side of things which i think a lot of issues probably comes from a lot of new combinations a lot of players not really gelling actually for scrum we're the second we were the se- we finished regular season with the second best scrum um but i think that's more due because of how they rank sort of thing so we so we only won the seventh most scrum penalty so we're still top half um but our actual scrum percentage on own balls quite high which is promising you know we're not get it's not rare that we're losing the ball when we're when we're back in the scrum so that's so that that's these better um now, when you mentioned about sort of like the cohesion and Dan, you sort of alluded to it as well as our attacks building up. So we got asked on the Twitter by Charlie Hunt, um, basically because we've got the new, a new attack and a new forwards coach coming in. Do you think performances are going to see a bit of a dip as these coaches stamp their authority or do you think we'll still be able to continue up on my own? I feel like from an attacking point, my understanding is that the new guy is there more to develop individual skills and Matt Sherrett's taking the overall attacking the structure so hopefully that's going to carry on that but what do we all think yeah um i i to be honest it's, it's, it'll be an interesting one because we're going back to something that dan said about being a better side at the end of the season compared to the start of the season some of that was bound to happen and i, I mean that in the sense of these players hadn't played together at the start of the season by the end they played a full season together so if they hadn't improved something's gone drastically wrong like if they haven't improved working together. But I also think individually, you look at individuals within that system. Ben Thomas, massive improvement this season. He's taking strides forward. Cam, obviously. Alex Mann, obviously. Mason Grady, likewise. But there's 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 players within that Ellis Bevan, another one, and I, I, I and and Dan said that he's he's not Thomas, but for a for a largely backup nine this season, he's been very, very good and has drastically improved I think the the interesting thing will be next season when you say about a new new attacks coach coming in and I do think it'll be jockey running the attack really um it'll be a case of can they then progress further rather than stagnate to some extent where they've now all learned to play together now all learned the systems now we'll understand it they go okay get to that level and then they hit a bar and they can't improve further. They still need to improve and get levels uh, ahead of that. Partly that'll be interesting with, and it'll be disrupted by Callum Sheedy coming back in as as to when he comes back in, because obviously um, he's probably going to miss the start of next season, which has two sides to it. It probably helps a little bit at the start of the season with the continuity of your your Tinas at Bevan, Bevan Tinas and, Thomas Axis, but then moving forward, whenever Callum does come in, which I'm sure he will, how is he going to integrate into that team? Because it's probably going to take him a bit of time to understand the players around him and things like that. Um, and then also some other new signings that we expect to see. Um, I personally think there will be growth next season, but I do think that those the team needs to win a close one early on as well. You know, just to to stop that tag of being the nearly boys and get that get that monkey off the back, then win another one. Then and if they can get on a roll, which would be a nice start to get two or th- two, ideally three on the bounce at some stage early in the season, then well, it could be a successful season. Possibly not playoffs, but it could be. I'll take that back. Probably not playoffs. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, too, I was I'll, way too positive for me. I'll, I'll, I'll re- already, already dreaming. <laughs> um, as you sort of, we sort of alluded to with a signing. Shall we just talk about a couple of the new ones that have happened this week and the ones that been the one that's been announced on air? So obviously, Cal- Callum Sheedy has signed. You know, he's sort of returned home. Um, our academy's been strengthened up with the likes of Tom Bowen and Stefan Emmanuel, who's. Uh, congratulations, Stefan, on being called up to the end of 20 squad. Uh, Steph Thomas has done an article uh, reviewing him if, if, on Wales Online if anyone wants to read that. Um, otherwise, coming in, we've got um, some you know ex- some experienced um, campaigners in Ed Byrne from Leinster. Uh, I said recently just now, Stan Thomas. Uh, Dan, do you want to talk through how you think this, this, the squad's shaping up? 
Yeah, I think Jockey was quite clear when he came on with us the other week, uh, well, probably about a month ago now, isn't it? About um, uh, time flies when you're having fun as a Cardiff fan. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, he was quite clear about the, the, the type of player that he wanted in terms of playing style, but also in terms of what they can offer the culture and, and the squad off the field. And I think if you, you look at the the recruitment, it, it, there's a clear line that it follows there. You know, Ali mentioned Ed Byrne, Leinster, you know, the terminal almost winning machine. That, like <laughs> they sort of get to semifinals, but we'll take a semifinal. You know, I'll lose in the semifinal quite happily next season. But that he's come from that environment. We've got Callum Sheedy is, um, is coming from Bristol, which Pat Lamb's got a good environment there. Uh, Danny Southwood from Exeter, where he's worked under Rob Baxter for a couple of years, another good coach, good environment. Uh, but the ones this week, then uh, you've got Rory Jennings, who um, as a player is is an obvious backup to Ben Thomas as a uh, can cover ten, primarily a twelve, good talker, good carrier, good solid defensively, is a goal kicker and a footballer as well. Um, he's started out of Bath. Um, which you know we've picked up a couple of guys who've come through there now. Gabe Hamer Webb, another one. Um, he's gone around the houses a bit, got good experience in multiple places, load of championship clubs, but like the amb- ambitious championship clubs, your Ealings, your Jersey when they were still going. You've been to Claremont for six, seven months, which isn't a bad place to play your rugby for a bit. Um, London Irish uh, don't disagree with all their off-field stuff, but as a as a core squad, they were um, they had some. Uh, pretty experienced guys in there, you know, a lot of top Australian international Southern Hemisphere guys, Agustin Cravey from uh, from Argentina. Um, and then he's been at Newcastle, which is interesting that we've picked up him and Ewan Stevens from there because obviously they've been not successful on the pitch. That is an understatement, I think, to say how their season's gone. But um, they've worked under some interesting coaches, somebody like, you know, Steve Diamond is a very much a Marmite figure in terms of... Uh, how people take him but I think I think a lot of players are probably better for experiencing that sort of thing and the diamond where where he's you know he's very tough and he's if you come out the other side of that I think it, a lot of players do tend to then kick on after working under diamond if 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 you carry on obviously some people have crumbled but Jennings is somebody who's played a lot for Newcastle this season has, has looked good in a poor team um, and now comes in as a more experienced player in a squad that has lost a lot of experience now i think obviously you can talk about signings but it's remiss not to mention turnbull ellis jenkins thomas williams reese carey willis alaholo you know that's that's hundreds of cardiff appearances that's a lot of international caps it's a lot of years in the game that are gone so ed Byrne, jennings this evening now as we record in we've announced dan thomas from bristol at open side again you know Come from Bristol, good setup. Um, has been in the game a long time. He's thirty now, so he's not, you know, he's not old. He's he's, he's still a high quality operator, but he has got plenty of experience, and he will be he will come in naturally as a leader within that squad. Then, and just the other thing I'd say about the signings is that it's interesting how he's sort of knitting players together. So Sheedy and Thomas come together from Bristol. Um, I had a quick look and Dan Thomas would have been at Gloucester at the same time Thomas Young had a st- uh, short stint there. Um, then you've got Stevens and Jennings coming down together from uh, from Newcastle. So it's um, interesting to see uh, with Jennings as well then who would have played with Ben Donnell at London Irish as well. So there's they're, they're not coming into totally new environments. I think probably at the moment, obviously Sheedy will know a lot of the boys from the Wales camp and from growing up in the area. So um, it's probably only Southworth who comes in as a as well, and not knowing been... anyone. Well, yeah, but I think... I suppose I think, he knows he'd have played against... A fair few. It, he's experienced <clears> enough <throat> to just come in as a leader as well, Ed Byrne. You know, he's been in the Ireland squad. He's been around the Leinster camp. I, I don't have any, I don't think he'll come in and like, you know, we'll struggle to chat to people. (laughs) I think he's, he'll be somebody he'll come straight in as a key member of that squad. So it's, it's building nicely. We do have probably three or four more signings that we need. A couple of nines would be nice. (laughs) So that Ellis Bever doesn't have to play by himself for the entire year. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting to see because 
you know, there was a bit of chat on Twitter last night about when Jennings was signed about is he underwhelming or you know is is it the type of signing you get excited for and no, it's not. You know, no, no one's excited with the greatest respect to Rory Jennings. You know, we're not gonna go parading him with his shirt through town like great we signed Rory Jennings, but it's it's a smart signing and that's where we are now. We're not signing big players anymore we're not even signing you know we're not going to sign the halaholo from super rugby who's starting for the hurricanes or whatever we're we're looking for these players who can provide value where others don't see them and that's uh, on paper at least because that's all we can judge them on for now every I, sign there seems to do that i'm you know, I'm, I'm i'm glad you sort of led on because this can lead really nicely on to uh what i wanted to ask francisco next <laughs> so Obviously, you've mentioned we've got a couple that we need some scrum hearts. I think a lot of people would would like a couple more second row. So, Francisco, you've been glued to the Pro D Der and Rugby Europe Championship and the Super Rugby Europe. Now, probably some of those top top the top top players there, we you know when we're, we're probably not going to get our hands on with, with our budget constraints. But are there are there any diamonds in the rough who you reckon would c- could come to Cardiff and do an absolutely fantastic job? And you become the next cult heroes. Well, I think there are diamonds or players that would suit up nicely with Cardiff. But I think first we have to try to understand if Cardiff is a, like a money money mall team, which I think it isn't. Um, and until we have a clear view of what Cardiff wants to be for the next three years, three years, because, well, when I got into Cardiff, and sorry for this prologue, um, I started to try to, 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 to get my bearings about, about it. And from what I've, well, in the Wikipedia page, sorry, I have to say this because I don't know, it must, it might be, have been one of you gets writing this because it's, it's just funny, uh, this part of Wikipedia. So you understand where I'm heading. Uh, wait, where is this? The, the Champions Cup misfits. This part is just funny. I look, <laughs> whoever wrote this is an excellent writer, and look, it's incredible because you told t- t- here an inspirational story. But when you see it, this is Cardiff all around, and it was because of the COVID, uh, of the COVID Omicron variant, variant at the time, etc. But it seems Cardiff never finds a structure inside the team. I think that's the most important part because you could bring Luca Matkava, who plays for the Black Lion and the Georgians. You are not going to bring him now because he's going to the... I think he's going to the Prodi there. I was not going to <laughs> spoil anything. The fun to, for everyone. But there's all the players like Luca Ivanashvili, who is, well, one of for me, one of the best, uh, youngest, well, 22 years old, uh, loose forwards, because you need... Uh, physicality and i think that was something that i missed that you might be completely against my opinion but Cardiff's physicality is not up there for the whole game it's in periods of time and you can't win uh m- maybe that's a reason because there's red cards because at some point someone gets fed up and tries to you know i'm going to draw the, the line here with a massive tackle and then goes to the head red card and this is not super heavy, so you're not allowed to do that. And after 20 minutes, <laughs> someone can come in and uh, your your spot is safe. But, and that's the thing. There's a lot of, of guys, you know, look, if you go to Portugal, you could uh, snatch, you know, Manel Ferreira, who is a nice, who is a very good kid, 90 years, 19 years old already, a starting player, both in the Lusitanos and the uh, Direito was one of the main teams in Portugal. But you need a direction. You need a staff that that stays and ha- and has a heart with it. It it can't be bigger than the team, and that I think there's a problem with the young it and everyone else before it's always bigger than the team, and you can't. And we did Cardiff. I have like six or seven uh, picks that I w- would would make it a better team, but at the end of the season uh, or the end of the night of the uh, end of the day. It's the project, really. It's the, the direction. And it's a word that we repeat a lot. And when you see teams in the project, uh, you can find it. Even, let me give you an example. Johnny May went now to Soyo Angolem, which is a team that had a goal in the last two seasons to stay in the project. This was a the goal. They, the, the team they built and the players they signed was to stay 
in a Padida, and they achieved it beautifully. Then you have other teams that have been packing up and and consistent, consistently uh, grown up, like Van, Bézier, Prov or Provence. I think Pro Provence wanted to snag the title and uh, send to the to the top fourteen because you can see it with the Tem North and all the other players, and they're going to sign. They're going to announce two more big signings. And these are teams with programs, with projects. It's going to be the, for the next three years, four years. Let's see what happens. And with Cardiff, and that's a problem. Even with the, now with the Dragons, you can see the direction the team they're trying to build. It's a fun team. It's going to be a very fun team to watch. It's going to be a good place to be. And Cardiff, it seems they are just trying to, well... Playing plot, uh, plot holes with with clay, and with break with a bit of uh, of pressure, and that's a problem. But there's a lot of, of guys. I said you have even Ashvili, Emad Kava, scrum half. It's a position in the the in the in the men's rugby Europe Championship. You won't find, but we'll find somewhere March and Ukamash. But those guys are already in the product there, and it's hard to snag him. But residing in in each country it's difficult you can find someone in the black line to, to fill the scrim half uh, as a back as a as a bench replacement but is going to is Cardiff going to lose four five five thousand euros a month to pay a player to to be on the bench i don't think it is uh, and now it's if it was to me with Cardiff in my hands i would say to the public for the next few years we're going to and in the bottom last or in the last three places because they're going to rebuild a team that's all about the academy players and some older guys and people should be patient but i think with well with the situation in welsh Arabia at the moment it's impossible you have this type of discourse because while someone will at the end of the night Armus park will be in fires and flames and people chugging in chairs and flags and whatever so it's a problem, and I think it's the direction the 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 the, the team wants to go. And I, I feel like, in, in fairness, like jockeys come out and said um, both on our when he came on our pardon at the start of the season that you know he did see this as a project and a rebuild, and that is what he's trying to do. He is trying to build this squad with you know with a huge core of Cardiff Cardiff Brown players, and then he's trying to bring in a few experienced heads basically just to replace the the numbers of experience the amount of experience we've lost over the last two seasons so i think um i think i mean i think you're quite right i think dan i saw dan nodding along uh when you argue it when you're talking about so you know we could do with a little bit more physicality in the pack i think that's thing that's been an issue with cardiff for as long as i've been a fan <laughs> um yeah, no, I mean, I, I, you're right. I, I mean, I think a top, I think a top, a top, a top international uh, scrum half isn't going to be coming coming our way anytime soon for the sort of wages they command, especially when pro day dirt clubs, even pro day dirt clubs, have a bigger budget playing budget than the rough sides at the moment, which is um a mad place to be in. Listen, are you going to get a guy like uh this is this is not real, but are you going to get like Samuel Marx to bench Ellis Bevan? Who is trying to become Cardiff's well, one of the main stars of the roster? Mm. That's a problem. So you have to get like a Gonzalo Bertarno that might not uh, be angry going to the bench, but even that is hard. So you need two good scrum halves, and it's not an easy process uh, to have in the team. But uh, I think it always co comes to the funding because you don't have that budget to 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 have a lot of players that are good options and are international stars i think what francesco francesco said is true, like previously we have had very little direction in terms of recruitment you know i reckon i'm trying to think when when was the last real i think probably since the last summer that danny wilson was here so 2017 it has recruitment has very much been haphazard and we've ended up particularly through COVID then where you get these COVID contracts, which have extended and extended and extended. We've had, we've been stuck with guys with the greatest respect to them that we didn't want to be at the club. You know, ideally they would have moved on, but they've where they've extended their contracts through COVID to take pay cuts. We, we've sort of been stuck with it. I think this summer now is going to be the first time going into next season then 
that there's no one in that position in the at the club i would say and i think this it is this is sort of like ground zero in that and that yeah the 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 they now need to build up their direction of travel. And I think jo Jockey's doing a, a decent job of that. Um, but overseas signing strategy is going to be interesting because you, yeah, you, you want, you want to get maximum money for your overseas players. You, you don't want to sign an, like an overseas nine necessarily to sit on the bench because they're going to be generally earning a bit more because you've had you've got to convince them to mm. come come to your club you've got to convince them to shift their families and their lives over to another country so yeah that striking that balance between not getting stuck with somebody and not putting too much money into one player like for like take a le petit tamani for example was great when he was on the pitch and but we paid him a lot of money to be injured quite a bit of the time there then as well. And so that that's a lot of budget gone into somebody in the medical room. So that that is going to be really tricky for Cardiff, deciding what they want to do, whilst also then not uh, signing players who are going to block this next group of players coming through. Because I think if you think about a Cardiff squad in, in three to five years, it's ideally got all the young players who I mentioned earlier, Winnet, Mann, Martin, uh, Evan Lloyd... They're all now the spine of your squad. They're senior internationals and they're the guys who you call on for your big derbies and your big European games. And then under that is the current crop of senior academy players who are all 18, 19 now. Who, there's a couple of real good players in there. You know, Ali mentioned Steph Emmanuel earlier, uh, Tom Bowen, a couple of the, the props, Dylan Barrett and, and Harrison Rock look like good prospects. Tom Howe at 16 is already playing under 18 international rugby. But uh, so they've got to come through. And and then all you're looking at then is probably two or three overseas players to just complement them in areas like second row and at tight head, where we don't produce many players in, not just in Cardiff, in Wales in that position. You know, we, we've got very, we just as people genetically, we just don't seem like to fit being 120 kilograms, six foot five locks or... 130 kilogram massively powerful scrummaging tight heads we you know how how few of those that we have is not a necessarily a reflection on the development pathway just more on like what is actually available to us as people um so that that's where i think they've got to get to and it's just about how you don't want to be signing players now who are going to block you getting to that but you also want to sign some players now who will help you be somewhat competitive on the way there so i, I don't I don't uh, envy the people doing the recruitment for us at the moment at all, juggling budgets and squad management and not really knowing what budgets are going to be in next season, let alone in two or three years. It's that, that it, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I, mean, I think it's an interesting time, but it's also, it could well be one that in hindsight, we look back in two or three years and go, Oh, actually we did do that wrong. Um, but think as things that are at the moment, the decisions being made, I think you can understand the rationale behind them. Yeah, I think that's that's an absolutely fair point. Um, just sort of going, I feel like you know, we we sort of been quite quite serious in there, so I want to sort of lift this up. So to talk about some of our sort of more favourite moments, favourite moments through the season. You know what? You know, talk about some of the highs, best games, the best tries. I know we did our awards last week, which. Cohen, uh, Cohen, unfortunately missed. I don't know if you heard who who got got what award. No, I didn't actually. I, I, I yeah, I generally I got back on Monday night and I was busy yesterday, so I have no idea. So, I, I mean, I'll be honest. A lot of them were shoe in. So, unsurprisingly, can win it breakthrough player because again, absolutely fantastic. As, as Dan alluded to, one of Wales' best players in the Six Nations as well. Uh, Belcher. And so here, team has to be a player of the year. Uh, try of the year was Dan's pick because we had a tie, so we went for um, which, big Maserati from eighty-five meters out, skinning five players. <laughs> Tears yeah. from the Tears pre-season try has been robbed. There, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's I, 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 I found the clip and everything, but I don't know. Pe people don't appreciate preseason as much as they should. That's the problem. I feel the real robbery is Theo's third try against Ulster. Uh, <laughs> uh, Francisco, for you, um, I said, so you sort of said you know your favourite was that um, that 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 
tight, narrow win over at Dave Parade. Uh, any other any other bits that stood out for you? Uh, yeah, l- l- I f- forget to tell to tell you something about the signings. Um, there's something that makes it impossible for Welsh sides signing players like young kids. It's the damn Brexit thing. So for 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 imagine, guy a young guy with 17 years old go wants to go to Cardiff to play to academy or whatever from Netherlands. Let's say. Uh, one of the props, which I know two or three that are very good, and for that to happen, he had when he's eighteen, he has to have a job or a contract, a full time, to receive what is a passport, uh, a short term passport. And I've been helping players to, to try to get to 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 the UK, but it's almost bloody impossible. I can say mm-hmm. that at least two international. Portuguese players and one Georgian wanted to go to the URC uh, teams in, in in Britain, in Great Britain, and it's no avail because uh, they're kids and they need something that sticks them in it. So it's a problem. And well, if I'm now going to your uh, question, yeah, I would like to highlight. I think Tino is the because uh, a lot of people didn't fancy him, or and I don't get why. I I really like the guy. I think he isn't well. He's not going to be a Springbok, whatever. But he's a steady guy. He produces well enough. And I think my my problem is can Cardiff stay with him and Bevan for the next two years to create you no know, a team of scrum up and fly home to you no. Know, bridge something positive because you need time between the nine and the ten and uh, to bridge something and as then said also I think well your front row is not a uh, country's front row is not that bad but it needs tuning and maybe if a South African came in <laughs> hmm. can you get can you get a South African to come in someone like Oxneche or something. <laughs> give him, give him cake. Give him the best <laughs> pastries in all Cardiff, because I think if you stick with it, nine ten, bring um a new prop, a loose head, and let's say Vinash Philly. Yeah, you have. But going back, Tino Zubir for me for me is a highlight. I, I won't say Mason Grady because everyone already loves Mason Grady. He, he can be one of the great, <laughs> one of future greats for. Oh, uh, kids for, for Wales, but as a lot of them, he needs time to you know to rock his boat because I've seen a lot of promise in these young kids with 20 years old, and then 10 years from now we go to Wikipedia <laughs> for 40 games for Cardiff, five games for Wales, now plays in the Prodi there, or at the time it's going to be called the Prodi Free or Prodi Free X or something because it's going to be the, the alternate future, but. And I th- and that's for me well the the highlight of the season and um uh, it's that but uh, let me just say something I'm happy to have to picked Cardiff because if I was Scarlet I would won't wouldn't even survive that black black line defeat dragons are the dragons they're a cool logo but I don't get why you don't have a dragon in the logo you had a long time ago but you should have a dragon in your because it's a cool dragon and Ospreys come on no. It's not. It's white and black. It's free, it's a, a rabbi funeral club. Please, no, we don't need that. And Harley, you back to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I said uh, we might not have got a South African prop, but we've got a South African forwards coach. So hopefully that he might uh, give us, cool. give, you know, get that, get that, maybe turn some of those solid scrums into penalty win scrums. Um, I mean, arguably, I think our line out's the one that needs to be. Improved a bit more drastically, although it was a lot better the second half of the season than the first half. So, uh, so I think um, for me, I think I think one of my favourite moments has got to be that game against Bath. Yes, I know it's talking about yet another defeat, but you know the, the atmosphere, Pat, Pat, Pat Cardiff Arms Park. I mean, I suppose the, my, the thing as a whole is of of the four Welsh sides, our attendance increased, which bucked the trend. So you know, it just showed how much belief. Fans had and how well uh, the marketing team was going to try and get bums on get bums on seats or pack out the stands. So you know, um, that yeah, that's been great for me. The bathroom was excellent. I mean, I was a bit of a funny one because he was okay. Uh, you know, the Reese Carey running into the post and bouncing off was <laughs> is still just you know, I 
you know, I said, I'm, if he if he if he knocked himself out, so I don't think I'd have found it so funny. But it was the fact that it was just like nothing had happened. It's a bit like when you, when your toddler runs, you know, just sort of tries to tries to walk or run and then just falls flat on their face and gets back up and just you know the only acknowledgement they have of it is I hope no one was looking. <laughs> so you know it was good fun. Um, yeah, I mean it's been a great season. Um, sort of a bit more. Uh, Self-centered. I mean, doing this pod with, uh, with you, Cowan, and now Dan, now you've joined, has been been pretty good. So getting a chance to talk to that and talk to the jockey and Griff, Griff's been uh, quite good from the Cardiff front. I do think we, I think it's been something because our, our attack looks good, apart from the last pass or the last two passes. So you know, hopefully next season that's going to get. As I said, I think the longer that not just um, Bevan and De Beer, but Bevan De Beer. Thomas Grady, the longer you get that midfield working together, I think the better that's going to look. Go in, did you give your moat? Yeah, I, 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 it's sort of coming back to the De Beer thing. I probably, I'm probably been one of the strongest De Beer skeptics, certainly on this pod, has been. Um, and I, I, he 100% won me over in some performances and in other performances I wanted a bit more. Um, I think what's what's been really interesting is how hard Cardiff fought to have him. And he clearly fits the vision and fits the vision that Jockey has. And there's a lot to be said for that. And also, what's going to be interesting going forward, no secret about it, Ben Thomas is going his second choice fly half for Wales this summer. So historically, when Warren Gatlin says he wants to see someone in a position, you see them in that position in regions. What do Cardiff do next season? Probably fight back against that because they're going to have to because you look at the 12 options, I know it's you know, new signing and everything, but next season, Ben Thomas is likely to be first choice 12 again. If not, then who? I was you know, someone that... Harley praised a lot this season. Max Clark, I was surprised that perhaps he wasn't offered a, a bit of a deal. I don't well, I don't know that he wasn't, or I don't know that he if they could offer him a deal, but he would be someone that I'd like to have seen return if he, if it was possible. But um I just I, I think that's an interesting one going into next season, is that situation. The nines then as well. I I, I am excited about that. I think I think if you can get you want someone who's sort of twenty-six to twenty-eight. And then someone who's a young pup coming through. I think that's the that's the pro- process I'd like to see. Um, one's probably going to come from overseas and hopefully one from nearer to home. Um, but yeah, in terms of highlights of the season, uh, Boxing Day uh, comes up high, partly because I was down west with my um, partner's grandfather for the first time. And in my literal first react- uh, interaction with him was him going, dragons and terrible aren't they and I was like <laughs> yes <laughs> getting was, on <laughs> before I said any words I was like here we go we're gonna be okay um, it was pretty much the only interaction as well because he's pretty much deaf at the moment but um, it was it was um, yeah that was that was a highlight for me I think and and uh, overall the season I, I do you know coming back to the original point you've got to say some players have massively skyrocketed and actually I was really chuffed with the performance Evan Lloyd put in on Judgment Day. Just that, like, a guy who has been vilified a lot this season, sadly, because if, if we're honest, he's probably put in a bit too soon to, to, to certain areas. Um, but you can see the, the promise he's got and the prospect he's got as a player. And um, you can evict to some guys who know him very well. Someone like Mason Graydon knows him very well. You know, he was tearing up trees at youth level, he's going to tear up trees going forward. Um, it's just about giving that opportunity, giving that time to learn how to play a different position because that's what he's doing. Um, but he looks like one hell of a prospect going forward. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, Dan, did you want to pop in for a second there? Uh, my personal favourite moment of the season, uh, Racing Away, January, great trip to Paris, uh, drinking red wine on the Seine, like you know, classy. Um, and then the La Defense Arena was just something out of this world. What a what a ground that is! Like, it, it, it when you walk in there, it doesn't doesn't look real with the massive screen at the other end of it. But um, it was a good performance as well from Cardiff. Actually, I thought we would get absolutely blown away, but uh, even threatened to come back into it a bit in the last twenty minutes. And then 
a bit of nightclub in on the pitch then afterwards, you know, throwing, throwing some shapes. Parisians, absolutely shocked. They've never seen anything like it. But, uh, you know, that's what so happens when you're South Wales dance champion a couple of years in a row. But maybe I gave myself that award. Um, and then <laughs> my, only, my only other highlight of the season then, I've just written Rory Thornton's hair. I mean, it's just getting more, like, luxurious, lustrous. It's just, I, I just, how is it getting even better every game? I don't understand it, but a good bit of jealousy, perhaps. I don't know, but... Uh... I, I, I don't know if it's controversial to say, but I feel like as his hair is getting better, he's getting better a player. And I've maybe, noticed maybe the same thing's happening with Justin Tipperick. But, I mean, he had, with a, but with, you know, start from a much higher ceiling. Uh, Tip, Tipperick's is, I mean, purely in hair state, is he needs to get tips from Rory Thornton. I don't know what barber Rory Thornton's going to, but Tipperick needs the blow dry that Rory Thornton's getting here. Uh, like, this is cutting edge analysis for this podcast, by the way. We should do, like, hair stuff more often. It's just unbelievable. But I've got a picture of Dan Thomas here as well. That is, that is good, good hair. Luck, to be fair. That is good hair. So are we now the hairy, best hair team in the league? That's that's potentially something we can cling to. Especially I wish a faff came in even better obviously yeah. rory jennings looks a bit like me so naturally very good looking great hair and uh so if we've got the top three hair blokes in the league maybe we start on plus eight for hair alone in each game next season and then where the losing bonus point thing we'll just win every game so that i've sorted it i might pitch that to you i see yeah yeah absolutely the only problem is is when we play also because they do have Werner cock and for all his flaws he does have a very good set of hair is he signed for Ulster? Bernard Cock, yeah. Oh, it's been heavily rumoured for ages. Oh, it's a nice. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's been I'm sure it's been confirmed by now. I saw he'd left the Sharks, but I didn't know he'd signed for Ulster. Yeah. Speaking of players who've left places, um it has been announced Reese Patchell's left, isn't he? Um yeah. I'm just just in purely interested. I don't think it's likely to happen in any way, shape, or form, but <sighs> Would you take him back? Because of that I was just thinking about it as a really interesting one because of the situation with Sheedy and you've now got Ben Thomas and Tinas. If if that was on on the cards, would you be interested? It's just one of those really weird scenarios where you almost feel like you're gonna say no, even the quality of player that he is. I'd say yeah. I'd say no personally. Um not a slight on Patchell, but the only, I think the only circumstance I say yes is if we almost signed him as a like part player, part like academy skills coach. Because I, th- I think he'll be a great coach. Um, there's a lot with like uh, Glenn Tarv and obviously some dodgy people have come from that school, but some some good people too. Um, but um, yes, I think I think if in in that sense potentially, but I mean just purely in terms of do we need him uh, now? I would say no in that. Jennings can play 10, Thomas can play 10. We've got Sheedy, we've got to be a Josh Thomas signed for the Rags. He'll be pretty full time, I think, in pre season. Full back wise, win it and beat them and plenty of cover now. Uh, I think pre signing Jennings, I, I did a thread about Liam Williams as well. Like, I could have seen the rationale if you, if you see Beatham more as a backup 12 and then. Um, you could almost sign Patchell then as a, a 15 and keep mm-hmm. him out of the way of contact a bit more and uh, he can sort of control the game from there. But no, no I don't I don't think I would. I don't know where he goes, though. I, I'm not sure what the next step is for him. Um, I think but... the rumours are all Japan, but I, I saw a lot of things about um, potentially Dragons, which would be interesting because that would mean the Dragons have a halfback pairing of ex-Cardiff players via the Scarlets. With Dane Blacker as well. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I said, obviously, um, for me, I think the only way I'd be accepted for his patch was if you could look into a crystal ball and you could guarantee 100% he wouldn't get injured. Because, you know, you know, that was kind of hopefully why he was going to Super Rugby, where you know, physicality isn't as big a thing for your, for your 10. Whereas I think the URC, I think Tina Stabir has been our top jackler and quite up there on top tackles. Because you know the, the direct running with a lot of teams in this league, they do like targeting the chan, ten channel a lot more. Um, you know, and you can't get away with doing a Cami Lopez and sort of stroking <laughs> on his shoulder to, as a tackle attempt. What was he doing? Which what? has to be. Have you seen it, Francisco? <laughs> the the Camille Lopez sort of star jump and he's fallen off somebody. What what was he trying to do? What, was he trying to block the inside pass or was he just sort of like shitting out of it basically? 
played touch rugby or <laughs> it's not touch rugby or it's touch sorry i don't know it's look i have seen people do that in my lifetime and <laughs> it's i think it's a spread of a moment when you're desperate to stop a, a big man like that you try something. Some go tackle to the feet. He tried to shoulder tap him and say, <laughs> <laughs> you're it. And tiger it. And well, it didn't work because, of course, it was not going to work. But fair play to Camilo Lopez because it for the ages we'll have a beautiful meme. And I think he's <laughs> laughing at it at, at this moment. That has uh, to be top five worst tackles of all time, though, doesn't it? It oh, really this. does. <laughs> There are some uh, bad so, ones. We we talked about one three parts, but you know, like I have said, I think I think that top five. I think Nipper has three of them. <laughs> not sure, I'm not sure what you can describe. Nipper used to do as tackling necessarily. <laughs> I said, I think one of my fa- <laughs> one of my favourite uh, Nipper moments is the only time I've ever been to Liberty Stadium, as it was back then, and is it George no- and. <laughs> He just goes up to George North after the ball play's gone back up to the other end and he just gives him the slightest push to, as if to sort of say, ah, I'm having it. And he goes further backwards than North moves upwards. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh, Nipper. It's good, good effort. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not going to bother with the, with the rating for the for the season. Uh, I think we can all say it was better than we expected in the context, but as a, you know, four, four wins, four wins, one draw isn't, isn't where we'd like to be, particularly in the last couple of seasons we've been sort of on that 50-50 mark. But I said, I, I mean, one of the things we I said on the when I came on this pod to start off with was, you know, I th- I think what we needed was losing, you know, make sure that we were in the fight and that we were picking up points whenever we can. And we did that. Just not without the win, just without the wins. Uh so how about looking forward to next season? So we've had our fixtures out. It's quite a favorable run. So Zebra, Scarlet. Scarlet's home and away, Dragons home. You know, up to Christmas, up to Boxing Day, we've got four of the five derbies. Uh, Zebra at home, Ulster at home, Glasgow at home, uh, Edinburgh away. I believe are our fixtures, and then obviously the European fixtures to come out after the draw on the second of July. Uh, what do we do? We, what do we think realistically would be a good return for us from that from that block? Well, I can't remember what I said the other week when we did it, but I, f- I think if we beat Zebra, then I think we can win. I think I said five wins potentially up to the up to the Six Nations, because um, there's a couple of tricky ones in there, like playing the Sharks and that. Is it the Sharks or the Light? This is the Sharks, isn't it? The last one before the Six Nations, yeah. um, and we'll do that without our internationals, so that'll be tricky uh, where they're already in camp. Um, but there's there's some there's some close games there with Glasgow home in there. Um, is Ulster home in there as well? I think in that run. Yeah, Ulster, Ulster home. That is the week before the autumn internationals, which could be an interesting one. Yeah, but it's the it's the. Am I right in saying that we won't lose our internationals for that one? Because it is it the week before the. It's two weeks before the first game, though. Is it? Is that right? Uh, I no, I think it's the first game because the first game is that first weekend of November, and this is the last weekend of October, I believe. So we might they might pick him up early for the squad, but hopefully not. No, so I, so the we're playing our first game of the autumn internationals on the tenth. So that first weekend of November okay, we... is a blank week. So we'll have everybody for Ulster. And then also, obviously, Ireland teams, uh, they've announced this week, they're taking an emerging Ireland team to South Africa, I think, in October, aren't they? So I don't know if that'll impact our game against Ulster at all. But um... Um, that actually could be quite interesting, given with um, Richie Murphy, who's obviously taken over as Ulster coach. He was the 20s. He's, he's, he's very much gone into the I'm going to develop young players route yeah. because of Ulster's financial trouble. So, yeah, that could be an interesting one. I think absolutely. Definitely, we have to beat Scarlets at home. It's been too long. It's been too long now, and I'm getting fed up of the Turks getting <laughs> Turks mocking us. Yeah, because you know they're that. absolute. They're because they're happy to be absolute shambles for the rest of the season as long as they can beat us, or at least we, or pull it together for one more game than we did, and then think they've got some sort of moral high ground. So, uh, I think yeah, 
for me looking at we're looking at one two three four five five home five home games in the first eight rounds you know it, that goes up to six if you count New Year's Day against the Ospreys and then Sharks at home as well I have a question for Francisco I'm looking for... um they about the European draw they they've announced the Challenge Cup teams today but they've left a gap for two invited clubs if who who would you like to see invited well by merit i think the black line well uh, black line is not on the fixtures right no they've so they've yeah it's only the top 14 urc and premiership teams they've put uh, down at the moment okay. and they're going to confirm uh, two clubs before I'm, the draw i'm 100% sure it's going to be one of them, the Black Lion, uh, because it's what makes sense. They won, they won the previous uh, Super Cup, and uh, the only the only thought that might not they not be there right now it's because of the ongoing political situation in Georgia, which can well, we hope it doesn't descend even further down to hell because it's halfway to that at the moment. Um, it's hard because the the other second team will be the Tel Aviv Heat. I'm not saying in a, because they are a fully pro team with a lot of stars. Some there, some of them are in the MLR playing at the moment, so they will be the mo the team most fit to play in the Challenge Cup. I think the Black Line next season might win more than one game. It depends on the pool stage they fall into. They assign some. Very good players. They're going to lo they lost uh, Elias Pandarashvili to the Prodigy, and I think they're going to lose Luka Mat Matkava, which is going to make a dent in terms of their playing style. But the other team has to be the Heat, Tel Aviv Heat. Uh, forget Paul Portugal. Uh, the Lusitans are not ready for this, and if they go in, it might uh, be the wrong direction because all their hopes and concentration is on the men's rugby Europe Championship 2025, which is going to be decide who's going to the World Cup. The same goes for the Spanish, because I'm not seeing the Spanish doing that gamble, but I think in two, three years, they might prepare something. And then you have no other team. It's This is the problem. I don't know who they're going to invite. Maybe, maybe the Cheetahs? The Cheetahs mm. are not in the fixer, right? No. I think the Cheetahs really deserve it. Uh, it's a team that even without a strong competition like the URC, when they play in the Challenge Cup, they really show something. And I think it's going to be the two, Black Lion and the, Cheetah, the Cheetahs. Um, because of the situation is in, in, in Israel, uh, it's going to be difficult to have Tel Aviv hit in it. And there's a lot of doubts because if they play in January, February, it's going to almost overlap the season at the beginning of season the MLR. So it's it's not easy. It's not an easy thing, but I think it's going to be the black line because they truly deserve it. Um I don't know what Cochrane is going to change in, in the in the setup, but it's going to be a very, very interesting side as they signed Georgi Tsutskeritze, George International star a starter. Uh, Chachinadze and well, Kakovin might sign with them, so it's going to be a stronger pack. They might lose uh, someone in the in the back line, but it's going to be sure. I'm sure 100 percent the black line and the cheetahs. There's sorry, just quickly, just uh, just confirmed. Also, I, I I must have missed that. So when so Richard Cockle is head coach of the national team and for black line as well. He is both. Okay. I think he's both because the, the problem with, with him and now other things I can say this is when he was signing with them, the doubt was if he was going to also assimilate the Black Lion the setup or he was just going to be like consultant. Uh, I know. I think he's going to be the one of the head coach or one of the selectors. And that's it because the Black Lion is it's your, it's the Georgia national team without the guys that are playing abroad. So for me, it makes sense them playing with with it, and it's a fully pro side. They are fully pro, and they are ready to you know to play in the in the Challenge Cup. So with Cockerell with it, and with the more experienced side, I think they're going to do better than next season. Well, 
let's hope we don't have Black Lion. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let, let's have true. let's have the grudge match against Scarlet. They they, <laughs> they can go out to Tbilisi. <laughs> I, that, I, I don't think anyone like if you're looking at the draw. I don't think there'd be a club in in uh, any of the top fourteen URC or Premiership clubs who would want to go to Tbilisi to play the Black Lion there. Like having seen the game out there, was it Claremont who went out there? And I think. No, they played both games in France. It was Gloucester who went to TV. Gloucester. That was it. Yeah, that. I mean, that looked. That didn't look like. Obviously, it looked great as a spectacle. But if I was Gloucester, I'd be like, no, thank you. I don't want uh, that. Uh, and Gloucester didn't have uh, like a full, uh, full packed stadium in that match because if they had, uh, in Tbilisi is hell. They they the the fans deliver and it's. <laughs> It pumps up the, the the black line squad. So I hope so, Cardiff is not going to to Georgia for <laughs> for a game, for a pool stage game. I I hope I hope. I said if if one of the Welsh sides are going there for a run again, I don't hope it's not Cardiff, but I would be very tempted to go on the away trip there just because <laughs> I I I really do want to go see a rugby match in Tbilisi. Might have to might have to might have to ask the wife if I can cash in one of my good dad chips for uh... a. <laughs> But for a for a weekend away in the rugby championship or something, uh, I said I don't think Cowan. I don't think you gave an answer on what you thought would be a good season for this for this first first block. So I say I, Dan said about five wins. I say I reckon eight. I reckon six. I think is. I don't think it's realistic, but I'd like. I no, very I, much like six. I don't see six. I see equaling or plus one to the whole of this season, which is four or five. So um, yeah, I, I I think that's I think I think that is achievable. You look at you look at those games, Zebra, and and with all due respect, they massively improved at the start of this season. But it still has to be at home. You have to look at Zebra as a win. Like that's just that is just a non-negotiable. Um, and Cardiff would be thinking the same thing that it has to be a win. Scarlet's away. You know, I I remember you know as much as I joked about it, I remember going to that preseason game and thinking, "Oh, Scarlet squad looks good this season. It could be quite good." And Cardiff took them apart, and I was quite stunned about that. And thought, "Okay, hold on, Cardiff might be able to do the double over Scarlets and be one of the best of the regions." And well, ended up going the other way with Scarlets doing the double over Cardiff. So I think, I think looking ahead to next season, that's still a very winnable game down in Patrick Scarlets and the home game. Glasgow's probably a stretch. Um, although any anyone's a, a win at, at home. Um, then you go further further down and you're looking at your your dragons games. Um banker and I suppose. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, it, it's 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 probably not as much of a banker this season, you know, losing to what Francisco was talking about earlier with um Dragons making some really nice signings, and I think they could be a bit more of I to be honest, I'd be really glad to see it from from a neutral perspective. But looking at it from Dragons, it'd be nice to see finally having all that promise come reality. Because I remember pre last season they were talking about having four of their first five games at home. Let's win a couple of these, and it just didn't materialise. And it's um, that's that's also why I'm a little bit reluctant to go like, yeah, let's get four of our first five wins because we've got X minor at home because Dragons did the same and it didn't pay off. So, yeah, I also look at games, but there, are, there aren't any of those games I look at and think that's not winnable. Um, even Glasgow, I think, is the toughest one. Edinburgh away, I, I still stand by. I don't think Edinburgh are a good side, but it, it, Edinburgh away is always a tough tough task and they do seem to be getting better. Um, although they were dry as a backboard to begin with but yeah I think I do think four or five wins is 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 achievable come the year's day um it's just getting that over the line isn't it and I think you get that zebra win and you get that scarlet's win and then I think dominoes might fall further on but if you don't win either of those first two games then it's going to, it could be a long season yeah, so, Here we go. Um, for me, uh, I could I couldn't end it on a positive, could I? I had uh, to end it on a negative. Uh, <laughs> I said this, this is the reason what this this is the reason we had to get down on because both of us will just end up in a negative feedback <laughs> spiraling down to see you can be more negative and Dan Dan's already picked us up. Um I mean the reason because the reason I was saying I I think we really need to focus on getting this this 
end of 2024 block and get as many wins as possible there is just because looking at the way fixture so we've already alluded to we've got the Sharks just before Six Nations then in the Six Nations we've got Connacht and Leinster away and guarantee it'll be the one game that Andy Farrell releases they'll be the, they, they'll be the teams Andy Farrell releases players back to then we've got the Lions at home uh, straight you know straight after the Six Nations which is usually when any of our decent players are injured Bang. and then it's Benetton away who you know matter really sticky game now because Bennington are very good side at home. Then we've got Judgment Day against the Ospreys, which has just not been a happy get happy for us. Finish off a game get home game against Munster. Now we've been winning, if not very close to winning every time we've had Munster at home. So that's a little bit better. But then we end going against the ball going against the Bulls and the Stormers, which I think is a possibly the worst possible two fixtures for it for ending a season on. It is a joke, though, isn't it? The all four are ending out in South Africa. Like, it is, like, bona fide joke. I, I genuinely can't believe it, that they've managed to saw it in that way. I don't know why it's, it's fallen that way, but it is absolutely ridiculous. If, if I was one of those cynics who says the URC is completely anti-Welsh, I would say it is so that the South African sides could pick up some, bo- could pick up some wins and bonus points to make sure they get up into the top eight. Don't start because uh, no, 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 no conspiracy here. <laughs> I, I, it, uh, it seems almost to me more of a thing of that's when you want uh, fans to be watching and perhaps they've looked at um, viewers. And I wonder if that's played a part of it. I do wonder, but maybe not. Maybe that's also me being a bit cynical and not knowing what's what's playing a part. But I would be surprised if it's not playing a part. Yeah, that's it. I mean, one. I mean, one nice thing is our last home game is in April, which you know, because in the last few seasons, our last home game seems to have ended up in like March, whatever. It's that that is quite nice. Um, I said, I think again, we're still too heavily balanced one way or the other, but that's that's what they are. I think if if, if you've got to accommodate around going to South Africa for two weeks as a block, and the South African sides all have to, you know, they're trying to do their tours in stints of three and four. Three or four weeks. So, anyway, well, um, I would. It... I just, can I just say our last home game will actually be the second or third of May when we play the Challenge Cup semi final and batter somebody in that omen that we went to South Africa between the semi final and the final in 2018. So, I'd just like to be the first to congratulate Cardiff on winning next season's Challenge Cup. Third time lucky. Let's go. <laughs> it is our competition. It, 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 we just let other teams play it sometimes. Might just draw a third uh... star on there, uh, just quickly. <laughs> Surely, surely that's the thing, yeah. So that's that's an interesting top description. Obviously, so the Champions Cup, they've got the stars. What should we have for challenge cups? No, it used to be the Parker Pen Shield, so I feel like we should just have like like a load of pens. <laughs> Almost like a pocket protector style thing. <laughs> it's something naff like half a moon, isn't it? Like you get a full moon if you've won twice. You get like <laughs> So we're on we're on one moon. <laughs> just a, even better, just a photo of Rupert Moon. So oh no, <laughs> just like he a little, over the badge. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I said I, I yeah I wasn't sure if the challenge kept because they they have been talking about doing neutral semi finals for the for European gate competitions as well, which could be an interesting one. But I feel like yeah. that's a discussion for pods. Close to the time, or it might be something like they only do in the Champions Cup. Yeah, I think it's it's home semi finals or still in the Challenge Cup, isn't it? They don't go anywhere, yeah. even like it's not even like home country, is it? You just play them at home. Yeah, I think it's as long as you can get 15 times. I think, or is that no, actually, so, no, that's well, I, mean, that, I played, think that's just Champions Cup, isn't it? 15, we played 000. power home in 2018, and we're definitely not 15,000 the hours part. Yeah. Uh, and let, so does anyone have anything else you want to say to wrap up the season or just in general Francisco promised us a Jamie story oh you want to hear the tale of Sir, Sir Jamie the knight the, the dragon knight is that it yeah well, do you want well yes please go well I was going to write something about it like writing but because I had some other content to do to other places. I'm not going to be arrogant and say where, but um, let's try. So, Sir Jamie is a very patient man. 
he waited in a hill to another day to come in. His dragon was dead, but his love will forever be not dead. It's not a good rhyme, but this is a story <laughs> of rhymes. It's a story of a man that keeps fighting for the dragon, fighting with some of the worst Twitter accounts I have seen in my life. Harley knows who I'm talking about. But he keeps fighting with that while I won't say baldness is not a critic and it's not a negative trait. I think people who are bald are either very strong people or very humble and Jamie is both. But now that <laughs> and this is the story of Sir Jamie that next season he's going to be on the playoffs with the Dragons looking down to us Cardiff fans, the Ospreys and the other red team that has no name but has a dragon on its logo. <laughs> this is his tale. He's a good man, Jamie. And well, he didn't his team didn't lose against Black Line not like Hughes, so he doesn't deserve any bashing. <laughs> there you go, Jamie. Uh so Francisco has spoken. You will be a player a uh, top eight playoff team now. Uh, but we don't make the rules, that's just how it works. It's gonna uh, happen. It's gonna happen. Right. With that if it if it doesn't happen, I'm going to, to the arms park and I'll pay you all two beers. <laughs> Whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. I'll take that. That's sounds good. Sounds good for the champion for our challenge cup for semi final, isn't it, Dan? Uh with yeah, that that's then. Good challenge. <laughs> so with that, I think uh, it's a, that's a good place as any to end it. Thank you so much for listening to us, not just tonight, but for the whole season. That was our first season as a as a podcast, Dun and Dusted. We will try and have a few bits, get some special uh, get some special guests over the summer, but it's been a long old season. So you know, it probably won't be a week, but it won't guarantee to be weekly episodes, but we will be back fresh and ready to go for another season of Cardiff Rugby. Thank you very much, Francisco, for for coming on and sharing your pain with us in this group therapy mm-hmm. session. Uh, if, if you're not already following Francisco and reading his work, I highly recommend it. It is excellent. Uh, we'll share links out with all the things. Thank you, Carwin and Dan, for joining me on this adventure. Carwin, being on, actually, you've been on the pod longer than that. I don't know how I've ended up as the, the host of this. I think you just didn't want to. I was going to mention earlier as the only original OG of the pod, and then I was like, can't pull off OG. <laughs> I was told once by my music teacher I couldn't. The original Grump. <laughs> I said, I think OG, the original Grump in these cases. Uh, yeah. thank, and once again, thank you all for listening. Good night. <laughs>